If you want to take your Bibles tonight, we'll be in the book of John. And if you have questions for us afterwards, we're more than happy to answer them. Ask my wife all the questions. She's a better answer. <laughs> I'm just kidding. She just doesn't like to be put on the spot. But in all reality, if you have questions for her, I'm sure she'd be happy just to have some fellowship and stuff. And if you join us for a meal afterwards, we're open books for the most part. Um, I won't give you all the dirt on your uh, pastor. I have enough of it. <laughs> So we're open books for the most part. I'll at least protect uh, his childhood for him. <laughs> but in John 20, we kind of see a pivotal transition as Jesus is, comes back and as Jesus is talking to uh, some of his disciples. The reason I say some of them is, one, Judas is not here. We would have considered him a disciple earlier. But really a disciple of Christ is someone who's willing to follow him. So the disciples that are at this present moment, as he's getting ready to talk to them, he's really defining their place here on earth. That's really what he's doing. He's defining their place on earth. And we'll probably reference uh, by way, you'll have to turn there a little bit later, but we'll kind of reference some of the other occasions that, that were given the Great Commission. But I think this one is, is going to be a... a strong or pivotal point for your life. So we'll be in John 20, and we'll begin reading in verse 18. John 20, and we'll begin reading in verse 18. <sighs> Scripture says, Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were, excuse me, where the disciples were, assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when, they, and when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. We can continue on, um, and we might go a little bit past that. But really, we're just seeing an interaction with Jesus as he comes back with his disciples. And there's some key things that we want to pull out of this text, really for where we're at, both us and you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer for a moment. Father, just thank you so much for the day and just so grateful for the time we can spend here, Lord. And God, I just thank you for Mark's heart towards this area, towards surrounding areas, and God, really just towards the world. I thank you for the heart that you've given him just to guide a people, your people, God, towards and in the area of missions. Lord, I do ask as we get into this passage, Lord, for clarity of thought, Lord. God, I ask that you would give me the boldness to speak what you would have me to, Lord. But God, behind my mouth from saying what I shouldn't. God, I do ask that your spirit would move freely to those in this room, Lord, that you could speak to them because we're in your word. Speak to those that are able to join online, Lord. God, I just ask uh, again that, you're, that you would bring glory and honor uh, to yourself through this, Lord. And God, we just want to lift you up and praise you for it. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> so we get into this passage again. We see... A closed door meeting with the disciples. And we see that those doors are closed because they're scared. That's what the text shows us. They're scared. They're, they're worried that they're going to be persecuted. And rightfully so. They just watched uh, uh, their leader. They watched their rabbi. They watched their master be led to a cross. That's what they had to watch. And as we see this, we see as, uh, as Mary Magdalene comes in, she, she explains she's seen Jesus. I can just imagine the disciples. It was someone else. That, that's not who you saw. Well, how can you say that? Simple, because I know what my thoughts would have been. It's a reality. I know what my thoughts would have been. No, they killed him. I know what they did. We're good at doubting. We like to blame Thomas for it, but let's just be honest. We can get there too. So she comes in and she explains that she sees Jesus. We see the same day as they're in closed door meeting, Jesus comes to him. He comes in the midst of their assembly. And I can just see the worried faces. I can see the, the panic, thinking that the Romans just came in. Thinking that this is a general. Thinking this is someone that is here for the slaughter. Well, why would you say that they're scared? Because the first words that come out of his mouth 
are the same words that he used on the ship when they thought they were going to sink. When they thought there was a spirit walking towards them. Peace. Peace be unto you. They're great words from Jesus because he's the peace bringer. And as he says these words, he, he begins to build this uh, narrative for him. And this narrative is going to end with him giving a command. And we should take great courage in that as believers. He says, And when they had so said, he showed unto them his hands aside. Then were his disciples glad when they saw it was the Lord. He showed them the marks that he had for bearing their sin. The perfect one. The spotless lamb. Now crucified. And as he shows them his hands, as he shows them the side, they're glad. Well, why are they glad? Because he's dead no more. Well, how do you know he was dead in the first place? Well, Rome's the one that pronounced him dead, and Rome was pretty good at knowing when a person was lifeless. They were pretty good at knowing where to pierce a body to make sure you're lifeless. The, the piercing in the side was for a purpose. It was to make sure that there was no way this man lived. So as he's standing in their presence, as they see this uh, Jesus Christ risen from the dead, again he goes to a familiar phrase, peace be unto you. And then he builds a context that should be for every disciple's life. As my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. How did God send Christ? I want you to think of that. How did God send Christ? What was the purpose? Why was Christ here? What well, was to bear my sins? Why else was he here? He was here to show the Father to us. He was here as a direct example of who God is. Just as much God as he is man. So not only did he come to bear my sins, he was also here just so I could see God, so I could put an actual... Um, physical picture to what God is and how he acts. That was Christ. Christ was a direct representation of who God is, of who his Father is. And then he says this, even so send I you. Well, Brother Justin, does that mean I'm being sent to die? No, Christ already did that part. But you are being sent from him as he was sent from the Father, which means what are we to be doing? We're to be living our lives in such a way that we are direct representations of who Christ is to the world outside. Amen. When I look at Mark, I should see Christ. When I look at my wife, I should see Christ. Not literally seeing his face, but I should see the actions of Christ displayed in their life. When you look at me, that's what you should have an opportunity to see. That's what we're sent to do. I know Mark's been preaching, and I'm, I'm not even sure exactly everything that you've been preaching through. But I'm sure he's driven home some of the things that Christ did when he was here. You've taken time to explain some of the miracles. You've taken time to really just give an opportunity to see who Christ was. So I wouldn't be stretching it to, to imagine that you would have an idea that as Christ went somewhere, he was there for a purpose. He wasn't there for the purpose of the miracle although he did them, he was there for a purpose of the follower. The one who would give their life to God. The one who would stop trusting themselves and wholeheartedly trust him. From the first miracle at the wedding to the miracle at the cross to him ascending in heaven, it was all pointing us to salvation. Well, what about before that? What did they do before that? Scripture tells us that the law was for the exact same thing, to point us to Christ. The purpose of the law was to point us right off the bat to Christ. So when he's telling me, or when he's telling you, as he's speaking in the Scripture, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you, really he's giving us a tall order that can only be done in obedience and surrender to him. Because it sounds like a tall order, but it was for him too. Praise him that he's not calling me to die for all of mankind. 
Praise God, he's not calling me to live so sinless that I can die for you. Although he does call me to that. He calls me to be holy. He calls me to set aside the old man and pick up the new. He made me a new creature. But he's simply sending me to share abroad him, his father, his word, and give the Holy Spirit the opportunity to work in their life. It's a pretty awesome thing when we realize it. You are in charge with sharing Christ to a lost and dying world. Just like me, just like every other missionary and or church planner or any other pastor that's come up here, we're in charge with that. So what does that mean? He says, you receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. The reality that he's saying there is, I've died for them. Their sins are paid. Bring them to me. Now we're going to take a small, quick journey through Scripture. We're not going to necessarily turn to every passage. But from the first moment some of the disciples met Jesus, they heard these words. Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Yeah. Now they have this really cool thing as they're being reminded, as the Father sent me, so send I you. Go fishing. What a great thing he gave us. In fact, the Bible says we've been given the ministry of reconciliation. What are we reconciling people to? Well, we're giving people an opportunity to be reconciled with their maker. Well, what does this look like? What am I to be active in? As we're going through Missions Month, you're going to get a, a good amount of missions-oriented uh, messages. But I want to start here first. So I want you to go over to Matthew. I'm going to be at the end of Matthew in Matthew 28. And it's a common, it's a common passage. It's a passage that I'm pretty sure you've at least heard once or twice. But we're really going to break it down with, well, John. Is my... Matthew 28, the very end of it, we're going to be in verse 18. So Matthew 28, 18. But as we break this down, I want you to take it in this mindset. God sent Christ for a purpose. Christ is sending me for a purpose. Am I fulfilling the purpose Christ sent me for? If the answer is yes, it means that I'm being led. If the answer is no, it means I lost my way from following him at some point. I decided to get distracted by the yellow road sign. I got distracted by the deer to the left and came off the road. In 18, it says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. How much power was given to Christ? All power. I want you to catch that. All power. So when we're looking at John as if it's this overwhelming message for us, he was given all power. How do you think we get to do what he commanded us to do? Because he was given all power, and he empowers. 19 says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Son, the Father, or excuse me, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Well, what are we supposed to do there? What are we teaching them? Well, before baptism comes what? Salvation. So really that, that emphasis is on teaching salvation, spreading the news of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world giving them the opportunity to, to respond to the greatest message mankind has ever heard. Well, how are we going to do that? Because all power was given to him. And he sent you. He sent me. So, so we see the idea of baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, really confining it to, to the context of the church, the local church for that. And then he builds further. A lot of us stop at those two, though. A lot of us stop there. He says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. So we're to see them saved, we're to see them baptized, and then we're to teach them all things. 
that Christ commanded. Well, where do I find those at? Well, we have a group of 66 books. Starts in Genesis, ends in Revelation for how we have it organized. That are things that Christ commanded. Well, how can you say Christ commanded that? Because John tells us that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It later says that the Word was made flesh. It means that was Christ. So when we're looking from Genesis to Revelation, as God is growing me through different scriptures, guess what? I have an obligation to help other people grow in those same scriptures. I talked to Mark uh, probably three weeks ago, give or take. Really just uh, asked him and kind of explained what our Sunday service looked like. Can you explain your Sunday service? Ironically, we're doing very similar things. Well, that time that you guys spend on those uh, uh, Sunday evenings normally just... Learning in scriptures together. I forget what you actually called it. But that time you guys spend, it's an opportunity you guys have to grow with one another and to grow one another. It's a really special thing because it's commanded by Christ. Well, how am I supposed to do that? Because Christ sent you. Not only did he send you, all power was given to him. So when he's sending you, he's sending you with power. It's a special thing, especially when we know that the Holy Ghost lives inside of you. Because the one who has access to all power is literally inside you. So much to the changing of an entire eternity for another person. Remember he said, whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted. So focusing here first, I want you to think of Boulder Love event that you have coming up. You're reaching out to fire departments, correct? And as you're reaching out to those fire departments, as you're taking this opportunity really to show the love that you were once shown to them, you have a direct opportunity as you're reaching out into your community to share the greatest message they're ever going to hear. Amen. Well, what if they don't listen? It's okay, not everybody listened to Christ either. They didn't. Some of them were there for food, and when the food was gone, they left. <laughs> it's a reality. As soon as Jesus said, you're here because I fed your bellies, they didn't stick around. But there were some that did. Well, how can you say that? Well, we have the 12 disciples amongst others. When you're reaching out into the Boulder Love event that starts with you, it's a lot easier for you to reach Boulder than me and my wife. Now, you guys are conveniently close, however, to where we actually could come into the town of Boulder but I couldn't ask him to drive to our church. But I can send him to y'all. It's a reality. You have an opportunity to share the scriptures that God's taught you. Well, I'm kind of nervous in the scriptures. I'm kind of nervous teaching that to other people. Well, it's a good thing it's not about you. It's about him. If you read the tail end of Colossians, God explains that as you're growing in Him, as you spend that time with Him, as you're seeking Him in prayer, you'll have, you'll know how to answer every man. It's not on you. He teaches you. He guides you. He reminds you. So where do we go from this? said unto all nations. It's the first sentence, right? We're to teach all nations. I'm horrible with geology, but I'd imagine it'd be really hard to reach Boulder and China in the same moment. Even with the time spread, if I owned my own plane, it would still be difficult. I wouldn't sleep. We do have things like computers. We do. There are ways to reach in that sense. But it'd be really hard to see someone baptized online. To do the work, it's a lot harder. To be able to baptize someone's a lot harder. If the only communication I have is here. It's hard. What does that tell me? It tells me that a global missions has to go past just us and to other people on our behalf.
even Christ's time here on earth, Christ sent other men out. I want you to understand that. His 12 disciples, he sent them two by two. Well, why didn't Christ just go? He was God. He could reach more people without internet than any of us could with internet. In a moment. God spoke and, well, it was. And yet Christ's example to us is other people were going out to reach a lost and dying world. He didn't go with every party at the same time. God himself used other men to help him reach the world. So one way that we do things like global missions is we have, well, missionaries. It's a term that we use. Well, what is a missionary? It's someone who goes on our behalf somewhere else. In some cases, they're in foreign countries. In other cases, they're in foreign countries like Texas. Hopefully Michael Astor can hear this. <laughs> But that's a reality. And Texas isn't a foreign country. It's okay, I know. But they're in different parts of the United States. Because it's impossible for me and you to reach people in different areas at the exact same time. I know we have technology. I get that. But how much better is it to see a friendly face than to hear a friendly person? We're still social beings. How can you prove that? Most of us were not fans of COVID when we saw less and less faces. And that's not against what our country did. I'm not trying to, to slam any of it or any of that sort, but we do know what it's like not to see people. There's something about someone who can be right there with you. There's something about having a place that I can meet with my brothers and sisters within a closer proximity to my house. Is that a necessity? No, it's not. We know missionaries in the Africa area that have people walk hours just to get to church. Christ, when he was here, said that the harvest is what? It's ready. But the laborers are few. As Christ looks at us, as Christ tells us, as he sent me, I'm sending you. Well, here's the problem. A lot of times we think he sent Mark Martinez for Boulder. Right? A lot of times we put it on the pastors. We put it on the missionaries only. But he sent you the same. You have neighbors, co-workers, people that he will never have contact with. But you do. And you have the same message that your pastor does. Right. We know people in the Lions area that you'll never have contact with. But we do. And we have the same message that God shared with you. Or the Lassiter's Del Paso. Or any other missionary that's on a foreign field. As we think of what Christ has given us, as we think of the words, simply, I'm sending you, I want you to really just take an opportunity to ponder. Boulder's not far from where we're at. There's people in Lyons that have never really heard Bible stories. What's the population of Boulder roughly, Mark? Do you know? We're soon approaching 150. Out of uh, 150,000, how many people would have the same testimony? Who's that? What are you talking about? Never heard that. Where'd you get that story? Because it happens in a town of 2,500. Are you willing to allow Christ to work through you in that matter? 
your missionaries send you letters, whether it's monthly or bi-monthly or however they generally do it for the missionaries you have. They tell you what they've been up to. I want to ask you this. What if you had to send them a letter? What would that letter look like? Well, I'm not the missionary. But you're still the child of God. And if you were scared to send it to them, what's it going to be look like looking in his face? I want to encourage you in that. We have a job to do. You guys have the same job we do. Preach the gospel. By preaching, I mean the word proclaim. So not what we're doing here, but the proclaiming the gospel to a lost and dying world. Well, I had to do that because they need it. As a church, to see people baptized, and as a church, as a body of believers, to grow them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord is what we would say with our own children, right? Well, we're here we're to teach them to observe all things. Whatsoever Christ commanded us. It's a tall order, but Christ closes Matthew 28 with this. And I'll be with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. That tall order is awesome. Why? Because everywhere we get to go, Christ is right there with us. Because he said he would be. He said he would be. He's with us. So as you're focusing on your missions month, as, as we're here at the beginning, correct? As we're here at the beginning of it, I'd encourage you this. When you take a look in the mirror, are you being the missionary that the missionaries deserve here? Are you being that support person with your pastor? Well, I'm really nervous to talk with people yet. Go with your pastor for a while. It gets easier. I can't say it ever gets easy. It's always kind of awkward, but it gets easier. He'd love for people to go with him. I'm sure your wife would too. When you look in the mirror, are you being that missionary? Then we can ask ourselves, how do I reach out to the lost world? Because you're probably like me. You don't have an infinite amount of money to travel the world at any moment, at any time. But you do have missionaries that are willing to go. You have missionaries that are trying to do exactly what your pastor is doing here. See a church started, because he's not actually starting it, Christ is. But to see a church started and to just be called to faithfulness and watch a group of people grow in the same faithfulness for the same God. And even one day, maybe one of those people get to go do this all over again in another city. People from the original first century church are no longer with us. The mantle had to be picked up. It still needs past. I know your pastor's young. I know I'm younger. But that's not the case for all of them. Sure. It's got to go somewhere. They need the gospel, just like you and I. I'm going to close kind of with the tail end of the testimony that your pastor started for me. Um, obviously, we went to, uh, well, I went to Pastor Martinez's church, his dad, Martinez. It's hard using last names. <laughs> You're Pastor Mark. He's Pastor Martinez. That's just how this is going to work. <laughs> All right, so going to Preacher's Church, um, and we started, I think I was probably in seventh grade, maybe eighth grade. I think it was seventh when we first started there. But we started there because somebody who was a faithful church member, it wasn't the pastor, wasn't Miss Sherry, wasn't any of their family. It was just a faithful member that put an invitation on our door. That's where it started. Now, there's a lot of other things that happened that the Lord was doing in my life prior to that to get me to ask the right questions for that invitation to matter. But God was doing a work that they never knew was happening. And as a Baptist church, and that's what my dad grew up in, so at least he knew what they taught, kind of. He had an idea. So from that moment, uh, well, we went there, and I, as he said, I got saved shortly after attending there. Bleach blonde hair, the whole works. 
The Lord doesn't care what you look like. He doesn't even care where you've been. He cares where he can take you. That's a great thing. Christ died for sin. Not some sin, for sin. From there, obviously, he told you that we moved away in my freshman year of uh, high school. We spent probably the first year and a half looking for a church with no luck. I don't use the word luck very often, but you know what I mean by that. We couldn't find one. We went from extremely doctrinally unsound churches to churches that we saw the pastor getting arrested the day we visited. What? Like, we were in a lot of different places in, when we were there, and I'm not kidding. We went to a church when Mark came to visit that there was a lady pastor there who was definitely not used by the Lord for good. We saw a lot of different churches like that. So by the time I was saved to the time we moved was probably eight months. Maybe a year, but I'd say it's closer to that eight-month mark. I don't think it was a full year. Um, yeah, because we moved. Might have been a year on the dot. Because I saved in January of 03. We moved in 04. Not a very long time to grow. So this is what we were searching for the entire time we were there. My dad, not the most biblically-minded person. Um, my mom knows Christ, but she was a baby herself in Christ. So we moved to Arizona, and this is what we experienced. So eventually we fell out of church. Sitting in public school, having public school influence. And I'm not anti-public school to the point where I'm going to dog everything they do. I still got a decent education. I still have an idea of, of things that we needed to know just to survive in the world we live in. But I didn't have great friends there. So eventually, you know, we stopped looking for a church. We stayed out of church. As a baby Christian, eventually the Bible reading went. And he started looking like the world. There was an aspect of godliness because I knew better. And there was still conviction because I knew better. But I didn't have that support, which is what you guys have here. So after falling out of church... Um, for a while, um, a lot of things transpired. Um, I still have like an adopted family in Arizona. My dad was became an uh, alcoholic at the time. He was abusive at the time, so I didn't spend a lot of time at home. So I basically grew up with a different family there from about 16. Was very rarely at home because I didn't want to deal with it. So lived with them, still call them family, still talk to them consistently. Um, in 2000. 12 or 2013, their kid, my best friend at the time, was murdered. So everything I do in that town, it's a smaller town, reminded me of things we had done, so it was time to move. So I moved back up north, started in Wyoming for a very short time, just because I have family there, ended in Colorado before too long. My uncle was a member at Windsor Baptist Church, um, so not too far from here. Um, if you don't know where Windsor is, it's on the other side of Fort Collins on I-25. It's the best way I can explain it. So, when we moved back up here, started in church there. Um, why? Because God was faithful still. And he kept putting people in my life to remind me what he, I left. So we got in a good biblical church up there. Solid church, good doctrine. And I started to grow again. The problem is, is I still had a lot of the world mentality in me. Because I'd left God for quite a while. So as we're there... The Lord starts pricking my heart and reminding me that, you know, when you're in Longmont, you committed to preach. What happened? God, I have a real job now. The things we think that are okay to say, literally, that's, that's what we do. To which he'd remind me, well, I called you to this. Yeah, but God, that's, there's no money in preaching. And you make every excuse in the book. I had my own little Jonah story with the exception I didn't hate the people, which is why Jonah didn't go. I just didn't know if I wanted to be in the ministry anymore. In 2014, as I'm working, uh, we were doing a demolition job in Fort Collins at the old courthouse building. Um, it went from the courthouse, and then I think it was a restaurant combo building. Um, and as we're taking apart some of the copper and stuff of that, um, we were doing a demolition job. So the company I worked for liked to recycle the copper and all that stuff. 
um, which helps keep costs down for the demolition part because then they can recycle copper, they get the money off the copper, so it kind of evens it out so their costs can be lower to the customer. And in the process of taking apart some of the electrical components, the power got turned on. Not from our side, from the city side. It was off. And after I woke up from laying on the ground, all I knew is I was really thirsty. I barely even knew what happened. So honestly, at this point, I had so much adrenaline, I didn't even feel it yet. So I walked from, it wasn't quite a basement, but it was basically a basement where you have to go upstairs just to get to the ground level. Um, and then went out to the trailer to get some, a bottle of water because I was dying of thirst. And as I'm headed to the trailer, I realize I'm kind of dizzy. And then I look down at my hand, which was charcoal black. Like the color of charcoal, that was the color of my entire hand, up to about, right about here. And then I went to turn around because something was wrong. And as I turned around, I realized I'm really dizzy now. I didn't get my water either. But I realized I'm really dizzy, so I sit down. And I sat down at probably the only window that had someone working in it that saw me sit down and realized this isn't normal. So they got um, the supervisor that was there, and we went to the hospital. So God kept me away from work for two and a half months, working with your hands, and he took away my hand. So now I had no more excuse to him. But he began to work. And he really began to remind me. And he began to tell me who takes care of me. As I went to the hospital, my heart was racing enough that I should have had a heart attack. And yet I didn't. And the doctors argued what happened, because I should have been dead. But I knew what, who did it. I knew who changed it. So that happened in 2014, in April of 2014. By August, I was sitting at Heartland. After draining my savings and not even having enough money to pay for my first semester, because I couldn't work. So I had to live off something. And as I get there, I, I just knew that this is where the Lord has me going. I'm not, I'll ask questions later. So you didn't have money for your semester? Nope, not even a portion of it. I had enough money for fuel to get there, but by the time I got there, someone already paid it. That's God. It wasn't the first time that he's, or the only time that he's done things like that for people either. I say this only because he started that story, and it doesn't have a ton to go with the message, but I'm going to pull it into that. Why? Because when you follow God, it doesn't need to make sense. Because even if you have nothing, he still owns a cattle on a thousand hills. Which means when he calls us and he says, so send I you, he gives us the same advantage. He gives us the same thing that God gave him. I might be sending you, but I'm going to make sure the way is paved. It might not be an easy paving. It might be like Oklahoma City with potholes. Or I should say I-70. But he's going to make the way. And he doesn't need you to have things. Because all power was given to him, not you. And then he loans his power to you so you can do something amazing with it. So I'd ask you tonight, are you willing to commit here in Boulder to be that kind of witness. See, it's expected of us. It's expected of the other missionaries that come in here. Right. It's even expected of your pastor. But I want you to catch, Christ wants you to do the same thing. Amen. Even so, send I you. Are you willing to do that for him? Because he climbed on that tree for you. I don't want to belittle the cross or anything, but that was what he did for you. Like a lamb to the slaughter Even worse. I want you to think of everything he went through to get there. The beating before it. Everything. It's amazing. What he was willing to endure for you. Even so, send I you. Let's pray. Father, just thank you so much for the day, Lord. So great for all that you do. And God, I just thank you for the time that we could be here, Lord. God, I thank you for... The message your Bible preaches, Lord. God, I'm just so grateful for it. God, I just thank you even as we're going through this, the reminder that you continually give me of where you brought me from and, God, what you want to continue to do in my life. God, I ask, uh, knowing that you spoke to your people, Lord, I just ask that you would soften their hearts to respond to you, Lord. 
God, invite them into that sweet fellowship. God, we want to lift you up as you allow us to do something great for you, Lord, through your power and not our own. God, we just want to bring praise, glory, and honor to you, and we ask this in Jesus' name.